Can everyone see this? Looks great. Superb. All right. Um, so it has fallen to me to uh, give an intro to geophysical modeling. Uh, this, this exercise is going to have two parts, uh, this mini lecture first, and then France will take you through a, a, a Jupyter notebook, one of the ones that you copied in at the end of that last notebook um, on a, a modeling exercise. But first, the, the, the background information. So, okay, so uh, first some definitions. So we're gonna talk about um, geophysical modeling. What do I mean? Uh, in this case, I'm gonna narrow the definition to, to mean using um, idealized representations of the Earth to gain insight, insight into its properties and processes. And for the purposes of this, uh, of this exercise, we'll be talking about the solid Earth. So the, the Earth's uh, interior and how processes in the Earth's interior can deform the Earth's surface and the deformation of the Earth's surface is what we measure with INSAR. So here's just a few suggestions of things that it could be. On the left, you have um, a series of earthquake cycle related things, including co-seismic deformation, um, which is the deformation that occurs during earthquakes, after slip, which is a, a slip on a fault that's prom uh, that occurs after an earthquake, um, uh, after, after the stresses have changed in the, in the interior caused by that earthquake, you add additional stress and you can cause the fault to move. Uh, you can also have processes that involve um, flow of material, either the viscous material of the, the crust or mantle itself, or of fluids that are within the crust and mantle of the crust, um, induced by stress changes due to an earthquake. The middle panel here is showing a magmatic system uh, with a magma chamber and a dike and a, and a volcanic eruption. And all of those things um, uh, will deform the surface uh, if they're large enough and shallow enough. Uh, and on the right, we have um, uh, the, the phenomenon of post-glacial rebound and, and ice loading um, causing subsidence and then the rebound causing uplift. And this is, again, something you potentially can, can um, measure with geodetic data. Of course, geodetic data is the other part of the definition. And of course, this is a class where we focus on INSAR and almost all the examples I will show you, in fact, all of them will be of INSAR data. But just to, to point out that this is not the only um, method we have for measuring movements of the Earth's surface. You can use GPS, which is shown in the middle panel here, um, two um, epochs of uh, GPS data showing the vertical component of motion, uh, showing the difference between 2011, um, March 2011 and March 2014. Um, essentially, there is uplift in, in March 2014, which is due to the drought in the Western United States at that time. Um, there's less water in the aquifers, and so the crust is unloaded and there's actually rebounding elastically from the removal of water. On the right is an example of, um, of differential LIDAR, which is another method you can use to measure um, surface motion, in this case of the El Mayor Kukupa earthquake, which was worked by um, Mike Hoskin and his group, um, showing the movement of various faults in that earthquake. Um, one thing to point out uh, is that compared to um, these other methods, INSAR has a, has a slightly different measurement um, that it makes. Uh, GPS is a three-dimensional measurement, potentially, uh, if, you, if you have good uh, vertical control at continuous GPS stations. Um, which are long-lived and well and well well monumented, you can measure all three components of displacement, northeast and up. Uh, same goes for for a differential lidar potentially. If you uh, use the the, the best um, algorithms for matching pre and post movement um, point clouds, then you can recover all three components of deformation. In SAR, you can't. Uh, in some, can only measure one component of deformation, and we'll talk about that next. So, this is a very idealized setup of what INSAR can measure. Um, you have two passes of a satellite. They, um, um, the phase you measure before something moves, and the phase that you measure afterwards. And the interferogram, the INSAR data that you make, is basically the difference of the two phases between the pre, the pre. Uh, movement measurement and the post-movement measurement. 
you can see here that the, the ground has moved down and uh, between the, the first and second passes. And when you difference the phases of the, that you measure, you get some phase shift, which is due to that additional distance um, to the ground that the ground motion has, has introduced. Uh, we, we measure that, that, that ground motion and in terms of um, uh, what we would call a range change, which is the change in distance, basically, between the satellite and the ground target. And that range change is, made, is measured in the direction of the line of sight of the satellite. So you can see uh, here, I, I've shown the, I showed these two arrows showing line of sight, the line of sight direction. And um, if the ground moved up, then the range would have decreased. Um, between the satellite and the ground, and you would record a range decrease in your interferogram. And in, this current, in the case that I'm showing, um, the phase difference is positive, uh, which indicates that the, the range has increased. And so we often use these terms range change, range increase, range decrease to describe um, how, that, how far the ground moved in which direction. But the, the point really is that the, the measurement you measure, the, the displacement measurement you make, is is in terms of this line of sight direction. It's all to do with whether the ground moved towards or away from the satellite, and that is all. Uh, you can describe this in terms of vectors if you want. Um, so some definitions, you could define a vector pointing from the satellite to the ground target. We call this a pointing vector. This could be vector P. Uh, you could also uh, define a displacement vector for the ground. In this case, it's U. Um, the three-dimensional displacement vector of the ground. Um, I should point out that there are various sign conventions that are used for these. Um, it's by no means the case that, um, that the pointing vector has to be from the satellite to the ground. Some people define it from the ground to the satellite. Read very carefully um, the documentation <laughs> provided with measurements. Um, everybody uses a slightly different definition, it seems. Uh, but anyway, this, this, this direction um, it relates to the, the line of sight, basically, of the satellite. And this, relates, this U vector relates to the movement of the ground. Now, of course, you can take the, the unit um, pointing vector by normalizing it, by, by dividing by its length. Um, the reason you, would might, you might want to do that is then that the measurement that you make with the, with, um, within SAR is just the, the scalar product, the dot product between the unit pointing vector and the displacement vector of the ground. Uh, so R here, which we uh, you see here, is, is the range change. And that is defined as basically the, the scalar product of the, the displacement of the ground with the pointing vector, uh, the unit pointing vector. So what most of what we're going to talk about for the rest of the day is how we make this measurement of of uh, range change using INSAR. Uh, but for the purposes of modeling, we're going to assume that we have some means of making a, me uh, um, making a displacement field, um, making these vectors U using some kind of theoretical um, or, or uh, some, kind of, some kind of modeling software. So the key to modeling INSAR data is being able to produce these these vectors U and then being able to project them into the, the satellite line of sight. Um, I, I always include a warning um, uh, about this. I already mentioned it. I think that lots of people will use, have their own sign conventions that they use uh, for these, uh, these kinds of things. Um, some people show their interferograms in range change uh, in terms of distance change between the satellite and the ground. Other people can have, have and do show their interferograms in terms of what we might call ground displacement or line of sight displacement, which typically has the, 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 the condition that movement of the ground upwards um, is, is positive. So it's the opposite of range change. A uh, positive line of sight displacement could mean you know, that the ground is moving towards the satellite. Hopefully, when you, when you read papers or, or, people, or, or studies um, more generally, this is defined somewhere in those studies. Um, otherwise, you have no idea <laughs> what, you're, what you're looking at. Um, um, so be careful. Um, be also be aware that people might have changed their mind on what was the, the best um, convention to use. I mean, my early papers, I, I, I showed into programs in terms of line of sight displacement, assuming 
the, uh, the ground moving up was positive. Uh, but in later papers, I have decided to go with the, the radar engineers and talk about range change. So you can't even be sure that one, one, uh, one group or, or one, one scientist uses the same convention over the whole of their, their careers. Um, the other thing to check, of course, is if, you, if you're supplied with pointing vectors, check what the sense of motion that, that they imply is. Are they satellite to ground or ground to satellite? You can usually tell from whether the, the vertical component is negative or positive, uh, which of these it is. Um, but yes, make sure that the, the combination of the, the pointing vectors that are provided in the, the interferogram um, sign conventions are, are consistent. Uh, for what we're showing in this course, um, if you process an interferogram in ice with the reference image um, as the earlier of the two images, then your interferogram will be uh, a range change interferogram. So at least for what we're talking about, if you, if you follow that convention, um, you're, you're dealing in range change. Okay, so, so then assuming you have a code that can, that can produce displacement fields, um, X, X, Y, Z displacements of every pixel on your, in your interferogram, then um, we, we can make what we call forward models. Um, a forward model is a simulation of what INFAR would see if you have a, a modeling code and you provide it with a set of a priori um, model parameters. So the model parameters are the things that control uh, the pattern that you get. Here is a forward model on the right of, a, of an earthquake, um, the Eureka Valley earthquake in California in 1993. It's one of the earliest ones studied with INFAR. Uh, this was produced by one of my graduate students. And uh, you can feed the, the, um, the, the modeling code a series of, of, in, uh, of parameters for this, this particular earthquake, uh, the fault strike, the fault dip, the fault rake, uh, consistent with this being a normal fault, um, and the location of the fault, the depth of the fault, and things like that. Um, and you can, those are encapsulated by, the, in this equation on the left, the, um, the model vector M, which is a vector of, of different parameters. Um, so you feed that into a, a, a model. Um, in this case, this is, this is the ACADA rectangular elastic dislocation model. Um, and you project the result into the satellite line of sight. Um, and then you, and you get essentially as an output simulated data, D prime here in this, this equation. So the, the G, um, is, is some kind of theoretical model that includes the, 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 the calculation of the displacements and the projection into line of sight. So you can always do this, um, uh, even if you don't have actually any real data of an earthquake, you can produce a forward model. And it's kind of a prediction of what you would see. The other approach you could take is inverse modeling, which is where you start with data in, in the case I'm showing here, this is down sampled inside data um, that's already been unwrapped and, and, and converted into a series of point measurements. Um, and take that data and you feed it into your, into your modeling code and you get output a series of estimated model parameters. So this is often the mode that we, we take when we want to find out what, for example, kind of earthquake we had. And this is an earthquake from Turkey. Uh, from earlier in the year, um, we will go through a series of Jupyter notebooks that, that, that talk about how we can convert the data into something modelable uh, later in the week. Um, so here is the data that we're trying to match. Um, here is the model that I obtained when trying to match it using some kind of algorithm that, that tried to find the best set of model parameters to fit the data that we had. And on the right is, is, is um, what we would call a residual plot, um, showing essentially subtracting the, the model away from the data to show that you know, we have explained most of what we had in the, in, in the input data. There are some splotches here, which may be noise or maybe um, features of the earthquake that we didn't capture with this model. But overall, the model looks pretty similar to the data and it's a pretty good fit. Um, and so having gone through this exercise, then we have some idea of what the model parameters should be for this earthquake. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about in terms of the different types of model that we have, um, I'm gonna focus only on, on elastic 
models. And the reason for this is that most of the deformation processes that occur in the Earth's crust are, are elastic deformation processes in one way or another. We've known since the early 20th century, already since the 1906 um, uh, earthquake in San Francisco, uh, that, that the crust behaves like an elastic solid. This was identified by Harry Fielding Reed, who um, looked at triangulation survey data from before and after the, uh, the 1906 earthquake. And what he saw was essentially um, uh, the earthquake caused displacements of, 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 um, of the crust on either side of the San Andreas Fault. Um, so you have these three, three locations, A, O, and C. And you can see that um, in the earthquake, um, O moved from here to there on the left-hand side, and from here to from O to D on the right-hand side of the fault, as, as, as plotted here, showing basically that the, the largest displacements were near the fault. Um, but if you looked at the, the period before uh, the earthquake, a couple of decades of triangulation data before the earthquake showed movement um, uh, of, of, the, of the points near the fault was very small, but movements of the points far away from the fault were large. Uh, and if you sum the displacement um, from the period before the earthquake and the period during the earthquake, they basically sum to some kind of block offset, um, um, showing that essentially the elastic strain that was building as this, this block of material, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer actually, that would be good to know. I keep gesturing with it. Oh, excellent. <laughs> cool. Um, so this block of material was moving uh, with respect to this block of material. This is moving up and this is moving down on north and south and building up elastic strain in the bulk here. And that elastic strain was released during the earthquake, causing these movements. And if you sum this, this kind of slanted line with this kind of um, offset profile, then you get some kind of block shaped um, displacement profile for the long term, showing that essentially uh, the elastic strain is released, and these blocks of material have moved back to being um, to, towards their original shape. Well, that's the idea. Uh, so, of course, most of the models that we use for things like magnetic systems or, or faults are, are, are um, elastic models. Um, one term that you'll see often used in, in the, especially in the very simplest of these, these. Um, these elastic models is the term half space or elastic half space, sometimes isotropic elastic half space. What a half space means is, is a, um, essentially a, a semi infinite elastic solid. Um, what do I mean by semi infinite? I mean that there are two layers in this model. There is a surface layer here, which is air or something like that. This is like the, um, the upper layer is, is just uh, is, is, is not solid. <laughs> And then you have beneath that a solid layer, which is infinite in every direction. So it has a free surface and then extends down infinitely to depth as uh, an elastic solid and also in both um, horizontal directions, infinite as well. Um, so we assume then that the Earth's surface is flat, that the Earth is rectilinear. Of course, we know that locally this could be, this is a good approximation, but in in general, the Earth is curved, and also um, it's not the same material at all depths and all places. There are variations in elastic strength, um, so it's not truly isotropic, which means equal or same in, in every direction and every location. Um, so this is an assumption, um, but it's a simplifying assumption that makes the, the math of these models quite tractable. And then within, embedded within this elastic half space, you have some kind of geological structure which is moving. Uh, I'm showing here what could be a, a fault or a dike, um, some kind of subvertical structure which could move in some way. And with and the movement of that of the material on either side of this um, of this structure will deform the surface in a way that we can measure it if it's large enough. So. There are several very, very simple models that we, that we like to, to point to and use uh, that, can, that can produce uh, predictions of surface displacement. The simplest one for, for, for magmatic systems is the MOGI model, probably the simplest of all of, um, well, one of the simplest um, 
uh, model that we have. Uh, this assumes that you have some kind of spherical source, um, which uh, undergoes a change in pressure or a change in volume. Um, it could either be expanding or contracting. Um, it works in both of these cases. And um, essentially, you can predict the, the vertical and um, horizontal uh, displacement of the surface for a given um, pressure change or volume change, because the two are related. Um, I do have the, uh, uh, <laughs> I, see, I see comments about whether um, we have the PowerPoint. I, I have a PDF that I can share with you, and I will do um, as soon as I stop talking. Um, so you can predict basically the horizontal displacement, which is this um, uh, delta D from the original paper, uh, which is just radial distance from, from the point immediately above the, um, uh, above the source, and also delta H, which is the ver vertical displacement. Um, and it's a very simple model. You can compute this very fast, and it will give you um, something that often will look like the, the displacements you see when a volcano is, is, is active. Um, so this is a, this is a, a good model to, 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 to try because basically the computation is instant. Um, you just have to evaluate these two equations and you have, you have your displacements. Um, but some of the assumptions that it makes may not be, um, may not, may not be completely uh, uh, valid in that it assumes an isotropic half space um, that is fully elastic. Um, it doesn't account, for example, for the, the weakening of material around the magma chamber. Uh, we know that materials that are heated to high temperatures tend to lose their, lose their strength, and that's not accounted for at all. Um, it makes assumptions about the, the character of the, of the fluid in the, in the chamber. Makes, it assumes that it's incompressible. That may or may not be true, depending on the, the, the regime that, and the surrounding material. Um, it assumes uh, that your source radius of your, of your source is much, much smaller than the depth of your source. And um, again, as, as, as uh, sources approach the surface, um, this may not be true. It makes no account for topography. Volcanoes typically have some, some, some elevated topography above them, um, above the magma chamber, and this doesn't account for that. But anyway, you'll get some kind of idea of the displacement field. Uh, from using a model like this. And indeed, this is the exercise, or this is the basis of the exercise that France will take you through later on. Uh, the counterpart for the Mogi, for the Mogi model in, in the realm of um, uh, faults and dikes is the Akada model. Um, this is really what we should really call this the rectangular elastic dislocation model. Um, but it, then just like the Mogi model, I guess, it's not, this model is synonymous with the name of the of the scientist who, who coded it out first um, in this case. Um, lots of people have tried to solve the elastic dislocation problem for a, for a fault and made, made errors, basically, or found it was intractable. It is actually an analytical solution, but it's a very complicated one. It has a lot of moving parts. Um, and Ocado was the first to really nail that down and, and do it without making any great any errors. And, he also supplied a subroutine in Fortran that could do the calculation. So everybody adopted it at that point. Because it's an analytical solution, it's really fast to compute. Um, so again, it, it, it's not instant, but it's pretty fast. Um, it's, on modern hardware, it's, it's milliseconds to calculate uh, a sensible kind of model. Um, it's uh, capable of modeling fault slip. Um, it, if you look at this, this um, the, the rectangular source here, you can see that you can specify three components of motion of that source. You can specify what we would call a long strike motion, strike slip motion, um, dip slip motion in the, in the, sort of the up and down dip direction, or uh, displacement perpendicular to the surface, which would be opening or closing. Uh, those you can use, uh, opening and closing can be used to model um, the collapse of the cavity or, or the opening of the dike. Um, or a sill. I mean, depending on what orientation this, this thing has, you can model all of those things. Again, it's a half space model and it assumes that the, the, the material is of uniform um, 
uniform elastic properties, and that's a big assumption. We know in general that the superficial layers should be weaker and deeper layers should be stronger. So, um, yeah, this is a, an overly simplified model, perhaps. Another criticism people have of, of the Carter model is that it only uses um, rectangles to, to specify the source. And if you have something which is more complex in its shape, maybe it's curved or warped in some way, um, it can be difficult to tessellate a load of rectangles together to give you that, that, that complex um, curved surface that your fault might actually have or your dike might actually have. So if you want to, in, to, to produce a much more realistic um, model, then you can go to things like finite element models, which is if, if, if Mogi and the Takada models are overly simplified, um, this is really the other end member. This, is, this can be as complicated as you want it to be. Um, so the finite element method allows you to essentially solve for the displacements and stresses and strains to an entire volume of material and uh, allows you to vary the, the properties of all the materials uh, within that, that volume. Uh, so I'm showing here is, is uh, uh, a finite element model of um, essentially an earthquake that happened in, in the Himalayas in, uh, a few years ago, 2015, the Gorka earthquake. Um, here we were interested in studying the effect of topography on the earthquake. Uh, not least because it happened um, in, in Nepal, which is about halfway up the Himalayas. So what's shown here is a view, I think, looking to the southwest um, from the Tibetan Plateau towards India. You can see the Ganges Plain, which is nice and, a nice flat, low-lying area. And you can see, like, as you go through um, from, from, from the far field to the near field, essentially you're going through the Himalayas. So there's a lot of topography, there's some big ridges and some big mountains. Mount Everest is in, inside the, the domain for this model. Um, it has up to eight kilometers of relief um, or thereabouts across the model. So it's, it's complicated. Um, finite element models generally are, are discretized into tetrahedra or hexahedra, so pyramids or, or distorted cubes. And this allows you to, to, to incorporate um, complex geometries into the model. So your circuit fault could be curved or, or whatever you want. Uh, in this particular case, we, we were modeling a planar fault because we were going to compare our results to a card. Um, but uh, you can see that the surface uh, is not flat. It's not half space. Uh, there is definitely elevation and elevation differences across the model. If you wanted, you could, you could also introduce um, different regime, different um, bodies of different strengths within the interior of the model. You could, if you have information, for example, from seismic tomography or something like that, or a geologic model of what materials should be like, you can, you can impose those material strength contrasts and whatever you, whatever you know about the interior of the model if you want. Um, so in, in general, the sky is almost the limit in terms of what you, what you put into one of these models. Um, so you have a lot of freedom uh, to, to make your model as complicated as you like. It's not always necessarily a good idea for, for modeling to, to throw everything at a model because you, if you see an effect, sometimes you don't know what caused it out of all the things you added. Um, in this case, we didn't and we have any good information about what the interior strength contrast should be, so we just looked at the topographic effect. Um, on the downside, all that flexibility adds a lot of, lot of extra work on your end. Um, making the meshes is very complicated. Uh, you have to account for the discontinuity, so the, the, the fault. Um, that has to be a surface within your mesh. Um, you have to account for the topography, and so if you have other things, you have to incorporate those and make them fit within your mesh. And meshing is, is by no means straightforward. And then actually computing these models can be, can be really slow. I mean, many orders of magnitude more computation time than running an Akada model. Per se, an Akada model could run in, in fractions of a second, whereas these types of models can take hours to run, depending on how many um, elements you have and, and how many points you're trying to resolve on the surface. Um, this in particular mesh has 7 million elements in it. But in terms of what you can see, obviously, um, the complexity can tell you things that you would never see in an Akada model. 
So this uh, is a section through our finite element model of, this, of, of a forward model of this earthquake. Uh, and you can see uh, what's plotted here is the, the north displacement of the model. Um, uh, so this, this area is moving south because it's negative in the north displacement. But what you see is that um, as you move uh, across this, uh, this surface, that the amount of displacement you see in, in areas that are close to each other, which you would expect to have similar displacements, vary quite a bit, uh, and they vary with elevation. As you can see, that the, the, the peaks of these ridges um, have smaller displacements than the valleys. Uh, and we think that's because you can see we've taken a section through the model. Um, the valleys are actually closer to the fault than the, than the ridges. And so <laughs> this effect of topography is um, to modify your, your distance to the fault and therefore how much additional movement you get um, from, from being in a valley versus being on a ridge. And you would never, of course, see this. Um, in a Mercado model because the fault would be, uh, the surface would be flat. Uh, in between finite element models and, and, and Mercado, there is a kind of a, a third way, which is, has some of the advantages of, of, uh, of a finite element model in terms of allowing more complex geometries and some of the advantages of uh, the Mercado model in terms of having faster computation. We call these boundary element models. Um, these solve for um, these resolve things onto surfaces rather than solving throughout a volume. And so because you're reducing the dimensionality of your computation by one or one, basically, uh, these run a lot faster. Um, and they typically allow you to, to, to mesh your surfaces of interest with triangles or other, other polygons. Um, and so you can you can resolve or tessellate these together to make more complicated surfaces. So you see a curved fault here, make that with triangles. This is a hydraulic fracture, again with polygons. And you can even make um, cavities somewhat like a Moby source or indeed um, elongate in some way if, if you want it within uh, your elastic medium. Uh, so these these allow you to look at some of the some of the effects of of complexity, for example, complex geometry of your of your source. You can even um, use a, a complex surface to represent the Earth's surface and calculate the um, displacements of a com more complex surface. Um, so you can look at topographic effects and things like that. But it does not allow, at least none of the codes available right now, allows you to look at um, things like heterogeneity and material properties. So you can't say I have a weak layer than a strong layer or something like that. And it's still quite a bit slower than running analytical codes. You can take seconds to minutes to run rather than minutes to hours, but it's still better, it's still a lot longer um, time than um, uh, than an analytical code like a Carter or Mogi. And that's because you have to actually solve these numerically, which is more time consuming. So a couple more things to mention before I let you go and actually do some of this. Um, a couple of things that we'll revisit um, later in the week. Uh, one of what the first is um, data downsampling. Um, typically, we do not try to model every single pixel within an interferogram, at least not when we're doing the model. We might do it for visualization purposes later on. But um, during modeling, we typically um, throw out a lot of our data. And you might wonder why. Um, it turns out that inside data are very highly spatially correlated. If you look at a pixel in an interferogram, especially one, for example, that's far away from the feature of interest, uh, and compare it to its neighbors, um, its neighbors will be moving at about the same amount. Um, and, uh, and so there's no additional information really from having, having lots of pixels far away from an earthquake, say, uh, to try and model it. Um, so to capture the process that's going on, you can you can you can leave out a lot of your data and still still not lose much information. And the reason that you might want to throw out lots of your data beyond this is that um, it the the number of data points that you try to model uh, really does affect how fast your computation is. If you try and model all of the pixels in an interferogram, there are millions typically. Um, this will take you a lot longer to do than if you're trying to model, say, 
uh, 200, which is what's shown on the right here. Uh, what's shown here is a, what we call a quad tree decomposition, which is a commonly used method for, for image compression, not just in NSAR, but, in, um, but also in, in, op, in, in actual imagery. Um, and what's shown basically are large squares where, where um, the data are very similar to each other. We specify a variance threshold, um, uh, standard deviation squared, um, of, the, of the data within a, within a zone. And um, only if the variance is larger than that threshold do you actually divide this up into smaller pieces. Um, if you're far away from, from, the, from the earthquake, basically all of these blocks are the maximum size allowed. But if you get closer and closer to the fault, which runs through here, uh, you can see it's where the, the gradient and the data is, then the variance starts to increase. And to keep uh, all the points within a, a box at the same variance, you have to start subdividing it. So quadri method basically is to divide um, things into four smaller blocks um, if they are above that threshold. So you'll see as you get closer and closer to the fault, the blocks get smaller and smaller and smaller um, as the variance increases. So this is a way of, cap of focusing sampling on the areas where there, there, there are details um, and reducing then the number of points you have to model to the ones that are really important. And we have a, a notebook and that, that, that goes through how you can do this using some freely available tools. Uh, the other thing to mention is that there are different types of inverse modeling. And since a lot of what we do is inverse modeling uh, in terms of trying to figure out what happened from an interferogram that we, that we have. Um, inverse modeling can be linear or nonlinear. And what I mean by this is that um, linear inverse models usually Im Im imply that there is some linear relationship between the quantity that you're looking for and the displacement field that, that you get uh, from your model. Uh, so for, for earthquakes, for example, the, the amount of slip, which is the, the, the distance that the fault moves, um, in an earthquake is linear related to, to um, linearly related to displacement. So here I have uh, three models of, of the same fault, but with different amounts of slip. And what you see essentially is that uh, as you double the, the amount of slip, then the pattern gets larger in terms of the, the total, the maximum displacement that you see on the surface. Um, it also can also detect displacements further away from the fault. But essentially, what you're doing is you're just amplifying the, the, original, um, the original pattern um, by, by increasing the slip. You can see, for example, this contour here, which is the maximum slip on the south side, the maximum surface displacement on the south side of the fault, it doesn't move. Um, all that happens is the slip gets bigger, and so you can detect slip for, uh, displacement further away from the, from the fault. Um, so this, this occurs if you know, for example, certain things about your model. If you know the geometry of your model source and you can fix that, then all you, all you have to vary is the amount, of, um, uh, the amount of slip or the amount of pressure change in your NMO source. Um, those are linear parameters. Um, and so this, is a, this turned out to be straightforward to solve because essentially you can represent the, the model as a series of Green's functions. You can do pre-computation. You can compute what the displacement field should be for every point on the surface um, for uh, one meter of slip, say, on, on the fault, and then just scale the displacement field by the, by the amount of slip to find the, the actual amount. You can do that match using um, least squared methods and have you and it's, it's a relatively fast and simple process to figure out how much slip there was in an earthquake. Basically, there will be one of these models or one of the continuum of models, which is the best one. And uh, using this kind of approach, you can, you can find it. Unfortunately, um, most, most things that we are interested in solving for are not linear, or at least not everything is linear. Um, if you are interested in solving for, for geometry, um, of, of your source or its location or its depth or its size, all of those things have a nonlinear relationship with displacement. Um, so for example, doubling the depth of a, of, of, of a source does not linearly change the displacement by a factor of two somehow, or even a factor of a half. Uh, 
it's not predictable at all in, in that sense. And I'll show you, I show that on the right, actually. The same earthquake, again, this is the one we, have, we saw before with two meters of slip. Um, this has a centroid depth, which means the depth to the center of the fault of six kilometers. Um, but if you increase that depth by 50%, make it nine kilometers and keep everything else constant, you see several things. You see that lots of the detail goes away. Uh, the, the maximum amount of surface displacement is reduced. It's not surprising, perhaps, if you're burying your, your, your fault to a greater depth. You also see that the, the location of the maximum displacement is actually migrating away from where the fault is. Um, that is a feature of um, burying an elastic model, where essentially you get uh, se greater separation of features. Everything okay out there? Someone need to mute themselves? I think someone does need to mute themselves. Well, can you mute? Can you mute people? I'm working on it. Takes a little. Takes a little time to find people in a list of 100 people or 88 people. Um, Got them, I think. Okay. Um, and then you see if you bury it even deeper, the same, it's even more pronounced. Um, the, the displacements are smaller again. The, the peak displacement is even further away from, from the, the fault. Um, another thing that you might notice is that the, the pattern becomes more simplified as you, um, as you bury it to greater depth. Uh, you don't see any of these wiggles and bumps that you can in the, in the shallower model. And that's basically because the, the elastic crust acts like a low pass filter. And fine details kind of are, are smoothed out the deeper you bury something. Uh, to, to model something like uh, to, to, to solve for the depth of the source, you can't use a linear method. You will have to use um, some other method. You typically use uh, nonlinear optimization. This is essentially repeatedly forward modeling something and tweaking the model until it fits. Um, you would usually start by um, a priori estimating what sorts of models would be plausible, maybe suggesting a, a range of possible parameters. And you can you have some intuition often, often from of what these might be based on, for example, if you wanted to know how long your fault was, you could maybe see that from the interferogram. Um, you have some kind of sense of what the spatial extent of your pattern is, and that will be related to the length of the fault. Uh, depth you might get from from other information sources from seismology or something. Um, same goes for, for volcanoes. You often know from, um, from seismicity how deep a magma chamber is. Um, anyway, you, you come up with a bunch of guesses. Um, you calculate what uh, uh, your first guess, how well it fits the data. You can come up with statistics that quantify that. We, talk, we call those penalty functions. And then you can vary the model parameters that you have in some way until you obtain a good fit to that, to, to your input data, to minimize that penalty function. Um, one way that we can use, do this, I will talk about uh, on Wednesday, which is actually making use of um, algorithms that are designed to do this. Um, and France, I guess, will take, take you through another method for that uh, now. That's all I have uh, on this topic. Does anyone have any questions about what I've just talked about? 